So thank you for joining uh, Professor Stephen Vladek. Uh, and you recently testified before the House of Representatives about uh, the Supreme Court's shadow docket. So if we can just start things off on a pretty broad note, tell me what the shadow docket is and why it brought this kind of congressional scrutiny. Yeah, I mean, so the, the term was, was coined by University of Chicago Professor Will Bode um, in 2015, but it actually refers to something that's been around forever, which is just that part of the Supreme Court's docket that doesn't result in what we call argued cases or merits cases where you get, you know, multiple rounds of briefing, oral argument, a big fancy decision, lots of opinions. Um, that's, you know, the most visible part of the court's work, but then there's the rest of what the court does. And so some of that's entirely anodyne, like um, giving parties more time to file briefs, um, structuring the argument, et cetera. But we're increasingly seeing that part of the court's docket being used for pretty significant substantive rulings um, where we're seeing either stays of lower court decisions that have, for example, enjoined state or federal policies. And then the Supreme Court steps in and says, we're going to allow those policies into effect even while these decisions are appealed. Um, we've seen a couple of rulings where the Supreme Court has directly enjoined uh, state COVID restrictions, especially um, those that are restricting uh, religious worship services. Um, in the election cases, we saw a lot of efforts, right, to get the Supreme Court to jump in. And I think, you know, the reason why the sort of the shadow metaphor seems apt is because um, these decisions are often unaccompanied by any reasoning, um, certainly by a majority opinion. Um, we often don't know what the vote count was or which justices were on which side. Um, they sometimes come literally in the shadows in the middle of the night. Uh, one of the most important COVID decisions came at 11.56 p.m. the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. Um, and so, you know, the court is increasingly handing down decisions that are having real impacts on people's lives that are just not the usual visible high profile merits decisions. Um, and so I think the, the animating idea behind the House hearing was, you know, before we even get to a question of whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, we ought to at least be talking about it publicly, bring, bring this, you know, practice out of the shadows, so to speak. Mm. And one of uh, your fellow witnesses during that hearing pointed out one tranche of cases that the Supreme Court has given unsigned decisions uh, about is uh, death penalty cases. And in some of these cases, you will have a decision where the Supreme Court uh, green lights an execution that had been stayed and the only existing ruling uh, is one saying that such an execution would be unconstitutional. Can you expand upon that where the life and death stakes of the shadow docket come into play? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the area where I think actually historically the shadow docket has been the most active is um, in death penalty cases. Um, that, that, that's actually the least novel, I think, of the sort of the shadow docket stuff of late. What, what's been different in the last two years, and this is what Amir Ali was testifying about, Amir's at the MacArthur Justice Center. Um, what's been different is that we've seen more and more cases where the Supreme Court has cleared the way for an execution when the lower courts had blocked it. Um, and so, although there's actually a rich, I don't know for sure the word, there's a there's a voluminous history of death row inmates, you know, on the eve of execution, trying to get the courts to block executions, going all the way back to the, you know, the reinstitution of the federal death penalty in the 1970s, um, and, the, and the reinstitution of the state death penalty in the 1970s. Um, what's new, or at least what really has ticked up, is cases where lower courts said, actually, we're going to block the execution, and the Supreme Court's like, no, you're not. Um, and so this is, you know, th this is why I think the shadow docket, although it's been around forever, has really, really become so much more important, and at least to my mind, problematic, because there are that many more cases each term where the court is changing the status quo on the shadow docket, where the court is, you know, lifting a lower court ruling, where the court is blocking government action that the lower courts had allowed to go forward, um, where the court is clearing the way for executions, and you know, those are contexts where I think there ought to be the most significant pressure on the justices to explain their reasoning, um, right? That, if, you know, lower courts in these cases are often producing, you know, 25, 30, 40, 50 page opinions explaining why they're acting the way they're acting. If the Supreme Court's going to upset that apple cart, it seems to me not unreasonable to expect that they tell us why. Um, right. And not just us, Adam, right? But like the judges, 
um, the lower court judges who have, you know, put a lot of effort into trying to get this right, state and federal officials who are trying to figure out what is and is not legal. Um, and so that's why I think, you know, the, there, there are some folks who think the term shadow doc is pejorative. I think it's just descriptive where, you know, the, the reality is that there's so little um, explication in most of these cases that it's really, really hard for any of us, but especially for the people who matter a lot more than I do, um, right, to figure out exactly what the takeaways are and what the rules are going forward. And so let's take the kind of consequences of the shadow docket uh, case by case. You'd mentioned the coronavirus uh, restrictions cases. What happens after the Supreme Court makes a decision of that weight lifting certain coronavirus restrictions, and there's no reasoning to describe why. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, we saw this um, a couple of weeks ago in California, where um, there was a challenge to uh, the sort of the revive, uh, revised uh, statewide restrictions on indoor religious services. Um, and, and there was, a, 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 I think, a capacity restriction. There's also a ban on singing and chanting in religious services. Um, and the lower courts refused to enjoin that, right? They said, listen, you know, it may or may not be a close question on the First Amendment, but, you know, it's not just about the merits. You also have to show irreparable harm. You have to show, you know, the balance of equities, favors, um, blocking this policy versus letting it go into effect. Um, and we got this decision late on a Friday night from the Supreme Court with no majority opinion, um, where there were six justices who were willing to enjoin at least part of California's restrictions, but the six conservatives disagreed as to which ones, um, and four of them wrote separately. Um, Justice Alito didn't write a separate opinion, but noted that he would give the state 30 days to justify one particular restriction, um, right? No one joined that, that particular statement. Um, and then there's a the three justice dissent. So start, you know, there, with the, the order in what, what I think everyone calls South Bay 2, where there's no majority opinion and the lower courts are expected to sort of figure out what the heck they meant. And then we get to the following Monday, where in a wholly separate case called Gish, the Supreme Court takes a different lawsuit and says, hey, district court, we're, we're vacating your decision and we're remanding to you with instructions to follow what we said Friday night in South Bay 2. They didn't say anything Friday night in South <laughs> Bay 2. Um, and so, you know, this is, I mean, there's, um, there's a district judge in DC, uh, Judge McFadden, um, who's actually written a law review article trying to hash out like what are lower courts to make of the precedential value of shadow docket rulings. Um, there's a Fourth Circuit opinion from last August, where the majority in the dissent are at loggerheads with each other, right, over what to make out of an earlier Supreme Court ruling in a stay in a different case between different parties. And it just, <clears throat> now I guess, Adam, you know, this is to me the central frustration, which is, you know, folks might like the results in some of these cases. Folks might dislike the results in some of these cases. I just want the court to tell us what it's doing um, mm -hmm. and indeed to tell us who's doing it. I mean, the my other favorite example that came up at the hearing, you mentioned the death penalty cases. You know, we had an example, I guess, what, two weeks ago um, where there was a scheduled execution in Alabama um, where the 11th Circuit, the federal appeals court, not exactly known for being super pro defendant, um, right, had actually blocked the execution because Alabama would not allow the prisoner to have his spiritual advisor in the execution chamber, um, and where the Supreme Court um, refused to lift the the injunction, right, refused to lift the lower court injunction, where the, the Supreme Court actually preserved the status quo. And there's a four justice concurring opinion, um, Kagan joined by uh, Sotomayor, Breyer, and Barrett. Um, there's a three justice dissent. Um, I think it was the chief and uh, Thomas and Kavanaugh. Um, and we have no idea where Gorsuch and Alito are, but we know that at least one of them had to be in the majority because otherwise it wouldn't have been a majority. So, mm. you know, it's just, it is, there are so many of these now, Adam, like it's not like this never happened in the past, but it's just become such a common recurring feature of the Supreme Court's docket at the same time as the court is hearing fewer and fewer merits cases. And I think yeah. that's why it's so important for us to be paying more attention because this really is increasingly at least as significant a chunk of the Supreme Court's overall workload. And one of the things that you noted in the House hearing, it's happening in more and more controversial cases. Uh, to sort of pivot to the uh, what happened in the post-election cases, I think that there was a lot of hope in uh, many corners of the legal community that the Supreme Court 
would not only turn down some of the meritless post-election challenges, but give it a kind of full-throated, uh, basic, uh, a, a shelving of all of the, uh, and, and a renunciation of what was happening. That didn't happen. What, what happened was, uh, would you describe that as a shadow docket? And, and, what, and what is the consequence of the Supreme Court not making its voice heard in rejecting those cases. Yeah, I mean, you know, the um, Tom Goldstein, who's a, a veteran Supreme Court practitioner and the found the co-founder of SCOTUS blog, you know, wrote a series of posts that I think were very powerful about why it was incumbent upon the justices to actually write an opinion, um, saying why they weren't taking, for example, Mike Kelly's challenge to all the mail and ballots in Pennsylvania, um, the crazy Ken Paxton Texas challenge to you know Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin, and Michigan, um, and the court to this date, right, hasn't written a word um, for the majority beyond just saying that they weren't taking the Texas case because of no standing. Um, and, you know, it, meanwhile, um, we had, I mean, as you know, we're recording this on on on, on Friday, just earlier this week, um, right, Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch and Justice Alito, right, all dissented from the court's refusal to take up the Pennsylvania late arriving mail and ballots case. Um, which you know means we know at least for once what the vote was. It was six to three. Because if one more justice had joined them, they would have granted cert. Um, but meanwhile, you have this problem where you have these two dissenting opinions. One by Thomas about why the merits of the challenge were actually pretty substantial. I disagree with him, but that right. Um, mm -hmm. And one by Alito and Gorsuch about why they think you know the sort of procedural imperative for taking the case was was was, was met. And no one responds to it. Um, and so you actually have, you know, and, and this has actually happened, you know, there are a number of conservative commentators who have been making a big deal all week out of the Thomas and or Alito dissents um, as if they're unanswerable just because they weren't answered. Um, and it seems to me like it would have been very, very useful for there to have been a very, very short per curiam opinion or even a concurrence that just says, hey, we're not taking this because we're ducking. We're, we're taking this, you know, we're, the reason why we're not taking this case is because we want to send the message that we believe the election was legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, and we're worried that if we take this case, you know, uh, people who think the election was stolen will, will completely misapprehend what this case is about, which is a small enough pool of ballots in Pennsylvania that it would not possibly have affected the result. Um, and, you know, that would have been a very helpful thing for anybody to say. And yet, because of the court's norms, which are all in favor of not saying anything in this context, you know, the Thomas and Alito statements go literally unanswered um, and therefore can be you know, misrepresented by those who want to misrepresent them as you know, sort of, look, the, the liberals don't even have a response to this concern. And it's like, that's not true. But multiply that by like 75. And that's every single one, or at least almost every single one of these shadow docket cases where, you know, in all but like two or three of them, the court's not writing an opinion explaining what it's doing. Right. And I think part of the thing that you were hinting at just now was that the Supreme Court in general and the Roberts Court in particular doesn't want to wade into political controversies. But Again, as you were saying, that impulse, if that indeed was their reason for staying silent, left these unanswered. Do you think that the Supreme Court's silence does damage to public confidence in, in this particular case, in the integrity of our elections, and essentially allows what has been called the big lie to continue? You know, I, I, it's a close call to me here, Adam, because it, it would have been so out of character. I, like, you know, it's one thing to not write an opinion when you're enjoining a state action, right? And when you're enjoining, I mean, this, again, I, I think this distinction is important. Like to me, there's a, it's a much bigger deal for the court to not write an opinion when it's changing the status quo versus mm -hmm. when it's preserving it. Um, and so, I, you know, there's no tradition of concurrences in the denial of certiorari, right? Or of majority opinions explaining denials of certiorari. Um, there's no tradition of like concurrences in support of the denial of a motion to expedite a cert petition, right? And so it would have been unorthodox in this context. So I think we have to keep two things separate, right? One is the court not explaining itself when it is changing the status quo, which I think has become a huge problem. The other is whether in a context where it didn't change the status quo in all these election cases, was there nevertheless some kind of obligation for the court to say something 
lest its silence be misconstrued by those who would misconstrue it. And, you know, I, I think that's a really, I, my, my default answer to that is no. Um, I wonder if this is the one case that merited an exception. Um, but again, I still think that's a different problem, right, from the sort of the broader shadow docket phenomenon that has not just been about these election cases. Right. And there is another case uh, this week that came down. Uh, now, uh, state prosecutors, uh, Cy Vance's office uh, has permission to go seek uh former President Trump's uh, financial records and has availed themselves of that to millions and millions of documents. Uh, that came after the Supreme Court declined a stay uh, without reasoning uh, being provided. Uh, but that case has a history. They have chimed in on that issue before. Is that the shadow docket in action or is that a different phenomenon? No, I mean, I think it's, I, you know, it's all it's all the piece. I mean, it's it's, it's another context where the Supreme Court was asked to change the status quo, that is to, to sort of, you know, the, the status quo in the lower courts was Vance is going to get the documents, Vance is going to get the documents. Supreme Court is asked to change the status quo, um, and it declines, right? So again, that's sort of the, the less controversial bucket, but it declined only after sitting on it for four months. Um, and, and I think that's not for nothing. Like, you know, another problem with the shadow docket is that the rules are basically whatever the Supreme Court wants them to be. Um, and so even though this was an emergency application for a stay pending appeal, um, the court took four months to say no, um, which, you know, had the effect, I suspect, intended of mooting it, since all of Trump's arguments for why he should receive a stay were based on the fact that he was the president. Um, no longer true. Um, but, you know, there's another case like that. I mean, there was a case where a district judge had blocked an FDA rule um, that required women who wanted to uh, obtain methoprestone, um, a medication, a, a medicinal abortion, to uh, appear in person, right, to, to, to obtain the, the drug in person. Um, and the district court had blocked it because of COVID and said, at least for COVID, you know, we're going to allow some male, some, some, uh, some, you know, male dispensation of the drug. Um, and the Trump administration goes to the Supreme Court and says, you have to stay this decision. We are being harmed by this decision that's allowing more access to mefeprex. Um, and they, they went to the Supreme Court in August, and the Supreme Court finally agreed that this was an emergency, warranting emergency relief in January. Um, and I just, you know, this, so, so yes, I mean, I think there's, there are all these ways in which the court is avoiding its normal procedures, departing from what in Congress they'd call regular order, um, in context where it hadn't in the past, in context where it's not clear what the procedural justification is for doing so, and in context where the result is changing the status quo without much of an explanation. And so I think that's, you know, whether whatever your particular soapbox is, whatever your particular substantive bugaboo is, you know, we're now seeing this across almost every major area of constitutional litigation. Um, and even in the Mephiprex case, non-constitutional litigation. And I think, you know, the, the, the notion that this is just sort of a passing phenomenon, I think, is getting less and less convincing by the day. And then the question just becomes, like, is there anything that can and should be done about it? And, um, and I want to get to that point very, very soon. But just to uh, emphasize a point that you were making, these are also happening in increasingly high profile cases where the public has an intense interest in knowing why the Supreme Court is ruling how it's ruling, whether it's the possible future prosecution of a president in an ongoing investigation or whether it's uh, the access to this drug. So how can the public get that transparency? What is, the, as you mentioned at the very beginning of our chat, this is a phenomenon that has existed as long as the Supreme Court has existed. Uh, how can the House committee where you testified exert oversight? How can the how can the public get oversight? Well, I mean, I think, you know, just talking about it, I think is actually a pretty good start, um, right? Public education. I'm actually um, in the middle of a book proposal um, that's, you know, trying to sort of explain for a lay audience why the shadow docket matters, why we actually should care about these seemingly technical procedural orders. Um, it's an interesting project trying to convince publishers that, you know, a, 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 a lay audience wants to hear about certiorari and emergency injunctions and stays. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a big believer, Adam, that just having conversations like the one you and I are having um, moves the ball at least a little bit because it helps people understand that these are just as important decisions sometimes, right, as the much more heralded, 
merits cases that we get from the Supreme Court. Um, but I also think that Congress is not powerless here. Um, so, you know, we're living in an era in which Congress has given more control to the Supreme Court over its docket than the court had ever had previously. Um, that's not an inevitability. And so, you know, it seems to me that one of the conversations we ought to be having, not just about the shadow docket specifically, but about court reform in general, is whether Congress has given too much discretion to the Supreme Court, whether Congress should actually be reclaiming more of a say in which cases the Supreme Court takes. And if the shadow docket, Adam, is a response to different pressures to, you know, as the Republicans tried to suggest during the House hearing, to the rise of nationwide injunctions, although I don't think that's a satisfying explanation, um, right, or to wayward district judges or anything of the like, you know, or to how long it takes for these cases to get to the Supreme Court. Congress has remedies for all of those things. Um, and so it seems to me that, you know, without the, everyone assumes that when we talk about shadow docket reform, we're talking about Congress like demanding that the Supreme Court disclose vote counts or demanding that the Supreme Court write opinions. Um, and I'd have problems with both of those. I'm not sure those are either wise or constitutional, but there's so much Congress can do short of that to make it easier for the court to expedite merits cases, to make it easier for the government if it's subject to some kind of nationwide injunction to you know, perhaps transfer the case to DC, um, maybe in capital cases to require those cases to be heard on direct appeal so that the Supreme Court has to consider the relevant questions before you know, the day of execution. Um, like I just, there are lots of things Congress can do short of, dear Supreme Court, you must write an opinion um, and you must tell us who voted which way that I think would actually be really salutary, not just in taking pressure off the shadow docket, but in really helping us understand better what's going on here and why these, why this has happened, why this phenomenon has occurred. And to the point of what you were saying about how conversations like this help bring transparency to the issue just by discussing and educating the public, what do you think the public generally isn't aware of. I'll give you an example of one of the things that uh, I have found interesting in engaging with the public as a reporter. When the election cases were going down, you were saying disclosing vote counts. I don't know if the public, when they see an unsigned ruling, they see no dissents, right? And explaining to the concept of reader to readers of no noted dissents. What does the public not know about the Supreme Court and what needs uh, more public awareness and education in your view? Everything. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, everything. I mean, Adam, we're, we're coming off of a we're coming off of a period where the entire conservative media sphere went bananas because the Supreme Court docketed a case. Um, right, which is, you know, as anyone who actually follows the Supreme Court knows, an entirely mechanical automatic thing the court does once they receive the documents, mm -hmm. um, right, and, 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 a, and, a, and a, a ministerial act that reflects no assessment of the merits of the case. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I just, I, I think there's so much, there are people out there who are going to misrepresent things to their own benefit, and we're never going to fix them, right, but there are folks who just don't know and who actually are genuinely interested, but just don't know enough to, to, to know what to ask. And, and that's where I wanna say, let's understand how the Supreme Court works. It's not typical that the court would take this action. It's not typical that a justice would write in this context, right? It's not typical that we would know what the vote count was, um, right? Just help folks understand what is and what is not unusual. Um, so that when they see, you know, as opposed to just sort of having to defer to, do I trust this media source or that media source, right? Folks, I mean, the, everything the Supreme Court publishes is publicly accessible. There are no secret opinions. Um, the problem is helping folks, you know, digest them themselves, as opposed to just picking their favorite, you know, their favorite side of the, of the spectrum to tell them what they should think. And, you know, I'm all in on, let's help people figure out what is and what is not usual. Uh, when it comes to Supreme Court practice, because we're seeing a lot of unusual lately, but that doesn't mean everything is unusual. And right now, the Supreme Court is obviously under very conservative control. Um, what would you say to conservatives who uh, about the need for more transparency over the shadow docket, who folks who might be inclined to say, uh, these people reflect the the, the majority reflects my interests. Why do I need to know more about uh, their thoughts on it? What would you say to, to those folks about why transparency is better for the Supreme Court, no matter who's in 
control of the court. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are two things. I mean, the first is, you know, most conservatives are actually not especially like enthusiastic about the shadow docket. I mean, usually the the defenses of the shadow docket are usually like it's not as bad as people like Vladek are making it out to seem, um, or it's an understandable reaction to lower court judges acting badly. Um, and you know, that's I mean, what's interesting about both of the and we heard both of those defenses from you know Florida State Professor Michael Morley, um, who was the Republican witness at the House hearing. And what it's interesting about like note what that's not. That is not a defense of the practice. Um, right. That's just suggesting it's not as big a deal as you think. And when they're doing it, it's justified. Um, but, I, you know, to, to, to sort of take your question at face value, though, I mean, I think part of what I'd say is, listen, if you want these results to actually endure, if you actually think that, you know, it's important that it's not not just that the California indoor worship ban gets blocked, but that a precedent is set going forward that future courts, that future government officials have to follow, including perhaps when the court is not a 6-3 conservative majority. Um, you should want opinions. You should want, you know, reasoned opinions that then become precedential and that then become subject to stare decisis, um, as opposed to one sentence orders that, you know, sufficiently um, clever and or confused future judges can find ways around or just won't be able to decipher. So I just, you know, it, it cuts in every direction, Adam. Like, I feel like if you like the results, you should want them to be as maximal as possible, um, which means, you know, signed majority opinions of the court enshrining these principles as constitutional law. Thank you very much. This was an excellent discussion and uh, and a very compelling testimony before the House as well. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time to come on and uh Look forward to keeping in touch uh, as the shadow docket continues to increase, but hopefully uh, receive some attention, transparency, and reform. Uh, uh, the, the docket itself more shadowy, but maybe the, the understanding of it comes out of the shadows.